Thank you, thank you, thank you. When, when Billy Graham first started preaching in London, some of the religious leaders of England were very upset. In fact, one of them said to him one day, you have set the cause of religion back 50 years in England. And Mr. Graham said, if that is so, then I failed in my mission. I intended to set it back 2,000 years. There are some things that we've got to base our faith on that are 2,000 years old. And we cannot improve upon them. We must keep returning to those foundation facts of faith. And those who will make a difference, especially in 1992 and in this decade of the 90s, are the people who understand that we must be based upon those foundations, those primary principles that are there. Uh, this year, I've had two seminary friends, people I've known since seminary, to, to pass away. Their lives had great thrust. They influenced many hundreds and thousands of people. Uh, tomorrow night I'll be speaking at a session in Fort Worth where 15,000 people will come and will be paying honor to one of those men. And you ask yourself, what makes the difference in a life and causes it to have that kind of thrust? And the fact is, it's because there were decisions that they had made. All of us live by our decisions. We are accumulations of our decisions. We literally sit and stand here today as the result of decisions that we have made in our lives. And all their decisions seem to be consistent with each other. Their lives had thrust and power and impact because they were constantly headed in the same direction and not scattered in many different ways. And the people that I have known and admired who have made differences in this world are those who seem to have consistently made three very definite decisions. One, Jesus Christ is Lord. Two, God's Word is true. And three, we find our lives by losing them for the gospel's sake. And in the very first century, there was a church of people like that. And they made a vast difference. And it's good for us to pray that we can set ourselves back in our commitment some 2,000 years and reclaim those primary kind of priorities which made them the people that turned the world right side up. Listen again to Acts 2, beginning in verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. The church of 1992, the church of the 90s, needs us to be that kind of church. The city of Jackson desperately needs us to be the kind of church that Jesus Christ would have us to be patterned after these folks when he was fresh and new in their hearts. In every decade, people begin to make studies. They take polls, they ask questions, they knock on doors, they meet with people. They try to find out what kind of people we are as we begin a new decade. And then they print those studies and eventually they become books. And now the books are out. And the poll takers and others and the students have, have decided the profile of the American of the 90s. And the soul of the American of the 90s is not a pretty picture. It is the soul of a self-centered, self-serving, individualistic person. It is the soul of someone who cannot long live in this world and prosper. Materialism, they say, for the 90s is in. The mania for more, he who dies with the most toys wins, this is in. But commitment is out. Loyalty, they say, is a thing of the past. People don't want to be committed to anything or any group or to any people or to be committed to anything other than their own self-serving interest. Commitment is in and loyalty 
is out. The polls tell us that 51% of Americans do not know why they live. They have no purpose. They have no direction. They have no aim. They do not know why they live on this earth. American Christians do not fare much better. The picture of the American Christian is not good. 95% of those who say they are Christians say they believe that the Bible is the Word of God. 12% of them ever read it. A people who were polled said, we believe in God, we believe in Christ, we believe in Satan. But the same people said to the poll takers, what we believe does not change our effect how we live. Now, if our beliefs are not believed important enough to change our lifestyles, then no wonder we don't share our faith. No wonder we are stagnant people who are not growing as we should. Church historians are telling us that right now, that the decade in which we're living, and as well as the 80s, will go down in church history as the hardest time to reach people for Jesus Christ in all the history of the Christian church. George Barna, who has written many books on church growth, has studied church across the country, has said that the Christian church, in fact, he said the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, is going through its most difficult time in all of centuries and most of the people don't even know it. We need, for the 90s, the church to be church. We need to be set back 2,000 years and become the people that our Lord would have us to be. We need to be founded and based and be the kind of people who say, these things I believe, Jesus Christ is Lord. God's Word is true, and life is found by giving it up for the gospel's sake. And that way we'll make a difference. And these people were like that. These were the people like that. They were people who were contagious in their faith. It was catching, and many people caught it from them. They enjoyed the favor of people around them. They loved people. They were not self-serving. They were faithful people. They did believe in being committed to someone and to something. And God said, I like that. I like that. And as long as your people like that, I'll keep adding to your numbers. I like that. And what that church was and what we ought to be can be gathered under three words. The words faithful and family and focused. They were faithful. The polls tell us that people today don't want to be a part of a group. They don't want to have to be responsible to any group. They don't want to have to show up somewhere on a regular basis. They, they want to live for themselves and do whatever they like and be free not to be faithful to any kind of group. But these people were faithful. They were faithful in attendance. The chapter begins by saying they were all together in one place. All together in one place. My friend Richard Jackson says they were all together, together. They were together in one place. In the, in the text in verse 44, it says all the believers were together. In verse 46, every day they continued to meet together. They broke bread in their homes together and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. They were together. They believed in being together. They were faithful in attendance. They were also faithful to truth. They were faithful to learning the truth from God. It says in the verse part of our text, in verse 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They wanted to know the truth. They wanted to understand the truth. They wanted to know what God had to say to them. It was important to them to learn the Word of God. In the poll taken among professing Christians, 48% of those who said they were Christians said they believed that there is in the Bible a book of Thomas. I hope you don't believe that. There isn't. 58% of these people said they did not know who preached the Sermon on the Mount. If we love the Lord Christ, we want to love His Word. We need to know it. I'm thankful that in this church there are hundreds of people who are committed to teaching the Word of God. And if you're not a part of a Sunday school class, you're missing something very, very special. I think you're missing one of the greatest things this church has going for it. 
People committed to teaching God's Word, to gathering in small groups and knowing and loving each other and learning God's Word together. Do you know we have a large number of children in our church who are committed to, to Bible drills? On Sunday night they come and they learn how to use their Bibles, just the basic things and how to find the books and how to find scriptures and how to, how to use and learn something about the Word of God. These people were faithful to knowing the truth. And they were faithful to prayer, so very committed to prayer. It says they devoted themselves to the teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Doesn't it seem strange that we say we believe God and don't believe God can do what we ask him to? Doesn't it seem strange that God's people can talk about him and spend so very little time talking to him? I spent time counseling with a minister whose light had gone out. That's a terrible thing to see. His faith had just simply burned out. And he said, more and more, I went around the country making speeches about God, but I didn't spend any time talking to him. I wonder if your light has gone out because you've not devoted yourself to prayer, to talking with God Almighty, to praying that he shall do what only he can do. In this church, two years ago, we had our greatest year. We had the greatest indications, as far as I could tell, that Jesus Christ was more Lord of this fellowship than any time I've ever seen it. We had the best year in evangelism. We baptized the second highest number of people that this church has baptized in all of its history. And the only thing different we did was we prayed we emphasize prayer. We emphasize revival and committing ourselves to the Lord Christ. We admitted to him, Lord, if it's going to happen, you're going to make it happen. And we prayed. I'm concerned about Jackson, Mississippi, aren't you? We've decided that some of us will get together, black and white people and others. Well, we're going to get together. We're going to pray. We don't know what else to do. We're going to pray that God will bless this city that God will do what only he can do to save this city. We're going to pray and pray and ask him to lead us to the next thing, but the first thing is to come before God and say, Lord, here is something only you can do. And I hope you'll join with me in praying for this city and praying that God will lead us and that God will save Jackson, Mississippi. I believe he will. And I hope you'll make your prayer groups and I hope you'll get before God and say, Lord, I confess my sin and I get the sin out of my life and I give myself to you and I ask you please to save our city. And I want to see people know Christ and I don't want to see children caught up in the drug culture. I don't want to see a record number of people each year murdered and all these people hurt and lives endangered and people having to lock themselves up in their own home. God, save our city. And we must pray. And pray diligently because I think it all depends upon our praying to the Lord God Almighty. It's just, just that important. I want to tell a story that some of you may have heard. It's, it's the funniest story I've heard all year. You should never introduce a joke like that. But it is the funniest story I've heard in, in, in many, many years. And some of you may have heard it. There, there's a core of several hundred people who are always here. And the rest of you kind of come and go, you know. And, and so I don't know who's heard what. But I want to tell this again, even with my own amazement, because I like it. But it concerns a little four-year-old boy. Are, are there any four-year-olds here in church? Uh, your first year in the big church? That's when in the Baptist church, four years start coming to church. And it's not an easy time sometimes, but I love having them here. And this little boy was a four-year-old. He was in big church. He did well on Sunday morning. But on Sunday night, he just couldn't cut it. It, it was too much. He talked. He he caused problems, he roamed around, he clomped his boots on the pews, all kinds of things. He caused problems. He had a difficult problem because he was the pastor's son. And, the, and his daddy each night would take him home and say, son, you didn't behave well in church tonight. He said, oh, daddy, I'm sorry, I'll never do it. Next Sunday night, though, the same thing. So one Sunday night, his preacher father had enough. He stopped preaching, walked down the stairs, went to the second row, picked up his little four-year-old and started walking out with a young man looking over his shoulder congregation didn't know what to do or say or think. They just watched that. And the little boy, just as they got to where he was about out the door and he was looking at all the people, this four-year-old over his father's shoulder said, Oh, dear people of God, pray, pray, pray. It's going to be bad. <laughs> well, that was serious to that young man. And I think God's word to you and me is, and the language of common sense to you and me would say, dear people of God, pray, 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 or it's going to be bad. These people were people who were faithful. 
They were faithful in attendance. They were faithful to the truth. And they were faithful to pray. And they were family. Or you read on the pages what a family they were. Talks about many, many ways in which they were family. All were together, had everything in common. Every time someone had a need, they met that need. Every day they continued to meet together. They broke bread in their homes and ate together. They praised God and enjoyed the fellowship of people around. They were family. They were family. Do you understand there's a difference between an audience and a family? There's a difference between an audience and a church. So often we just have religious audiences. But how I pray we would have church, how we'd have family. A church is family. A, an audience is just a group of people. An audience is a gathering of people. A church is a fellowship. An audience may be a group of people who come together to be entertained or to be enlightened or to get some of the kind of information. A church is a group of people gathered together to worship and love and serve Almighty God. An audience is just a pile of stones just put together at a particular time, just stacked up together for a little while and then it's all over. But a church, says Ephesians 5, is a group of living stones fitly framed together, each one fitting in his or her place to build a temple to honor and serve the Lord God. I pray that we would be family, that we would be church. They were family. There was no power posturing among them. People who love each other and who are family are people who don't have to have the love of power in them because they've had the power of love to work in their fellowship. And they were family like that. And they served each other. They understood what Christ meant when he said, he is greatest among you, will be servant of all. There's no communism here. They didn't sell everything they had and pool it. They, when they had need, if they had to sell something to help a Christian brother meet that need, then they did it because they were family. Everybody helps a brother or a sister or a mother or a father when there's need. That's what family does. I wish you could know. We don't tell you because the Scripture says when you do your alms, don't brag about it. Keep it a secret. Jesus said when you give to people in their needs, do it in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. But I wish you knew what a great heart Don Rimes has and how he loves people and ministers to them on a much more basis than just eight hours a day. I wish you knew how much is being done in the name of our Lord Christ. You remember, do you know what the cookie jar is? Back during 79 in the flood, we had 103 homes of our members to be flooded and wiped out, 53 businesses. Of course, there was no insurance. And the people in this church just quietly got together over $100,000 and created the cookie jar. And there is a secret group of people who go around even today looking for members of this church who have needs and finding out about those needs and quietly, secretly meeting those needs in the name of the rest of the family because that's what a family does. That's what a family's about. Family meets the needs. And people of God understand that God always uses his people to answer the cries of his people. And so they meet those needs and they care. I'm so very thankful that today there are some 50 people, 40 children, 40 young people, that's junior high and high school people. There are 40 of those and 10 adults who are at Crestwood Mission right now. Now, Crestwood Mission is in the heart of the high crime area of this city and in the heart of the poverty area of this city. And we do a lot of ministry there. Our doctors have built their own clinic and they, they take care of that thing. They get no government money. They get no money from anybody. They just built the clinic. And they, they're servicing people there and caring for them. And I, I love them for that. And Crestwood has a lot of this kind of ministry. You can come and bring clothes and food. Every Sunday you come to church, you can find the, the grocery carts all over these buildings. You just, you just put food and clothes in that and we'll make sure that the people who need those get them through Crestwood Mission. But today, 40 of our teenagers, our junior high and high school students, and 10 adults there to kind of protect them and encourage them to be with them are sharing Jesus Christ at Crestwood Center. They expect more than 80 young people who live in that crime and poverty area who have no real positive images of what a person should be, many of them at all. And our young people are going into that area in the name of Christ and saying, we love you, we want to share with you. They're wearing little bracelets with beads on them. 
These would have different colors. You've probably seen those. One represents uh, sin and forgiveness and death and life, and they share those to witness the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. They're doing that because, you see, a family is not only a faithful group of people, but they are focused. They're focused. A family of the Lord Christ, a church of the Lord Christ is focused. And they're focused on Jesus Christ. We read, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. What was the apostles' teaching? Jesus Christ. You read the book of Acts, you realize that they were, they were enamored. They were compulsed with sharing Jesus Christ. Every time they preached, they preached Christ. Every time they talked, they talked Christ. Every time they prayed, they prayed in the name of Christ. They lived for Christ. They, they died for Christ. They saw people on the street and they shared Christ. They were people who were focused on the Lord Jesus Christ. And they knew how much the world needs him. I bought a book several years ago about graffiti, you know, writing on the wall. Some fella took several years to go all over the country and copy down graffiti from, from walls of public places. I sure hope he wasn't on a public grant. But he wrote this book, and there's one chapter that talks about growing graffiti. And that means that somebody painted or wrote or sprayed or whatever a line on a wall. Somebody came along and wrote under that something related. Then somebody wrote under that. Had a whole chapter of this kind of growing graffiti. He said that on the wall someone had written, to be or not to be, Shakespeare. And someone else had written under that, to be is to do, John Paul Sartre. And then someone wrote under that, dooby, 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 do, Frank Sinatra. <laughs> Somebody wrote on a wall, God is dead, Nietzsche. Someone came along and wrote under that, Nietzsche is dead, God. In the 1950s, someone wrote what was a very particularly favorite statement of that day. He wrote, Christ is the answer, painted that on a wall. Some wag came along and wrote under that, what is the question? And then someone wrote under that, whatever the question, Christ is the answer. I'm convinced of that. Whatever the question in your heart, whether it be a question of loneliness, a question of guilt, of remorse, of purposelessness, of uselessness, whatever. Whatever in you says there is a lostness there, there is a vacancy there. Jesus Christ is the answer. And they were focused on that fact. And they were the church of the Lord Jesus Christ because that grabbed them and propelled them. And they believed that with their soul because it had happened to them. Henry Ward Beecher is one of the most popular and well-known preachers in all of preaching history. And when Henry Ward Beecher began his ministry, it was kind of underwhelming. Uh, nothing happened. Nobody was saved. The indifferent remained indifferent. The church did not grow. And he began to agonize over that. And one day the thought came to him, there, there must be a reason why when the first century church met, things happened. There must be a reason why there was electricity and excitement and things happened among those people. And he said, if there is a reason, I will find it if it is to be found. And what a wonderful search that is. And how wise we would all be to make that search. And of course, there is a reason. Because they were people who were focused on the Lord Jesus Christ. And they were not telling people, here's something we learned Here's something we have heard. Here's something that we have as a theory. Uh, here is a, a wonderful group to join. No, they went around with a happy, contagious kind of announcement. Not an argument, an announcement. Not a debate, but a declaration. They said, that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly that fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. They were focused on Jesus Christ. I'm not real sure that this is valid criticism, but, but I tell you, it bothers me. 
Do you ever read the religious newspaper, a religious page in your paper on Saturdays? Do you read the things that are sent out from almost anywhere, religious publications? Do you understand there are two words that are seldom found in any of those religious publications? Those two words are Jesus Christ. And maybe the reason the church has lost its thrust is because we have lost our focus on the Lord Jesus Christ. For you see, this is all we have. He is all we have to share. He is our only hope. He is the only one who can save us. He is the only one who can empower us. The Holy Spirit's job is nothing more than to make Jesus Christ real in your life. So you'll share him. Other people will know him and love him because you share him. Jesus Christ is our focus. God loved us and wanted us to know him, not just his power or just giving us a mountain or trees, not just his beauty or the beauty of nature, not just his laws or he'd given us a book with rules in it, but he wanted us to know him. So he gave us himself in Jesus Christ. And these people were powerful because they were focused, focused on the Lord Jesus. Jesus Christ. And I pray that for us. I pray that so much for us. The 90s need us. 1992 needs us perhaps more than ever to be the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not to reflect the world around us, but to change it. To show a self-centered and selfish people that there is life to be found in Jesus Christ. That life does not have to be that dull, dead, working to make money and spending all the money to try to find fulfillment and failing at both places. That life can be something real and alive in Jesus Christ. And he wants to give you that life. We need to tell them that. Not to be a reflection of their individuality, not to be a reflection of their self-centered living, but to show them that there's power in people who are focused, focused on the Lord Jesus Christ, living, trusting, follow him, focused on Christ. People who are a fellowship, a family, a family living together, a family caring about each other. Let's meet when we meet on Sundays, not as just a religious group, not a pile of stone just stacked up because there's no place else to go on this weekend, but a people who on the Lord's Day are part of a family, a family reunion who meet together and want to be together because we're faithful, faithful to that attendance, faithful to the truth, faithful to being the people that God would have us to be as we pray for our world and pray for God to do what only he can do. May God help us to be the church that 1992 needs us to be. Father, we do count on you so very much. We breathe because you let us breathe. You tell us in your word that our very breaths are in your hands. And, oh, Lord, we commit ourselves individually to you. We want to commit ourselves as a church to you, too, and ask you to do those wonderful things through us that you want to do. Lord, I pray you'll set us back those 2,000 years and we can be the power and the people for you that these people were. And I pray now you'll lead us in Jesus' name, amen. We're going to invite you to come and do that thing that would honor God. And, of course, this is a time of decision, and I'm going to ask you to remain seated. I'm doing that because I don't want you to leave. I don't think you've worshipped God until you've faced the fact that God has said something to you, and you're supposed to respond to it. And I pray your response is yes. And so let's, let's just remain seated. Some of you be thinking about your own life and your own commitment about how you're willing to be faithful, faithful to attendance and faithful to truth, faithful to pray, faithful to be part of a family and to build family and to be pe family and to love people and meet the needs of people and care for people who are your brothers and sisters in Christ. Pray about your focus. Is your focus on yourself or is it on Jesus Christ? I pray you'll make those decisions in your own heart you need to make. And there are some who've come this morning, I think, probably planning to walk forward and say, I have received Christ as Savior. 
I'm ready to do that thing that God tells me to do, to be baptized, and I want to follow him in that. Perhaps others would say, I want to be a part of this church family, and we need you and want you so very badly, and I, I pray you'll come and be a part of us. But I, I don't know what God would have you do, but you do. And so when we begin to sing in just a moment, just stand up and walk forward, and, and we want to meet you at the front and welcome you as you do the thing God would have you to do. But this is very definitely the most crucial time in your worship period today. And I pray you'll treat it as such and that God will work in all of our hearts. As we sing, those of you who come to make public decisions, just stand up and come and we'll meet you at the front as you make those commitments. Mm -hmm. 